nominated as trainer of the year in the Eclipse Awards, but also if my count is right, six-year horses are finalists in the various categories. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. That, that actually means more than anything the, to us. Our team is the horses getting the recognition, and uh, those six horses certainly deserve it. Yeah, it's uh, certainly uh, a big year. You had a great year, and uh, following up uh, a good 2016, where, again, you won the Eclipse Award. And I want to go, obviously, uh, an Eclipse Award is a great national honor, international honor, for that matter. But I want to go back to a few weeks ago. It was kind of fun. The Times Union voted you Sports Person of the Year for 2017. And there was a nice Q&A with our friend Tim Wilkin. Uh, I enjoyed that. And you mentioned uh, how it was an honor for you. And I just think, as a horse racing fan, it was great for me to see a horse person be Sports Person of the Year. It had to be fun for you for kind of the hometown newspaper to recognize you. It really was. It was quite an honor. And I, I tell you, put a big smile on my face seeing that because, um, you know, growing up in Mechanicsville and, you know, a Times Union, you know, is, is everywhere you look. And it's just, um, you know, it's just it's a, it's a big accomplishment. And I, and like you, I, I always like to see uh, horse racing get good publicity um, in the capital region. There's so, so many fans around that I, I get to feel it during the Saratoga meet every year. And, uh, and hopefully it uh, brings a few more fans in. And I have to ask, did, did you play high school sports in Mechanicville? Because I'm just wondering, uh, you know, <laughs> did you envision being Sports Person of the Year at some point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, play, I played some sports, and, uh, but, but never, never good enough to, to make it the Sports Person <laughs> of the Year in the sports I was playing, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, just like I spoke about in the Q&A, um, what a great community to grow up in. What a nice city. And I, I still enjoy going back when I can find time. And, and um, it just seems like uh, I always run into somebody I know and uh, still a very close-knit community. And, and uh, I really like the opportunity to bring some recognition to it. And uh, so hopefully we can uh, provide some more in the years to come. Yeah, that was a nice uh, answer you gave, kind of giving credit to Mechanicville. And I grew up in Amsterdam. And I think it was an upstate community that's very much the same. It was a great place to raise kids. It was a great place to grow up. And you go back and you see people uh, you, you remember, and you talked a little bit about Mechanicville in that fashion. Let's go back before we talk uh, some of the horses uh, from the last year and going into this year. But before we do that, for people who aren't familiar, uh, Mark Cassano, I said to you before, uh, we went on the air. We're filling his slot now, filling his big shoes on Saturday morning. But he had the final show a few weeks back, and he and Mike Veach were sitting in here. And because you're a local guy, they had a conversation about you and kind of tipped their cap to what you've done at such a young age. You just turned 39. And again, a lot of great accomplishments at a young age. But for people who don't know, tell us how you got into the horse racing game. Well... <clears throat> Just being, you know, growing up so close to Saratoga, and I was fortunate to have parents that took me to the races as a child out in the picnic area, and I just fell in love with the sport. Um, I just, I, I wanted to find a way to, to work with horses, and um, and over time, I was fortunate enough to meet the right people at the right times, and uh, really network and learn from some great people, and and a lot of people along the way opened doors for me, and. Um, I consider myself to be very, very lucky uh, with the opportunities I've been given and, uh, and all the people I've met. And, um, and I'm, you know, I just love my job. I wouldn't do anything else. Um, like any other business or profession, it can be challenging, particularly when you own your own company. But, um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I love horses. I love, love working outdoors. And, uh, and for me, it's just the greatest sport on earth. And you, you mentioned the, the people that you kind of mentored under. Give Toss out some of those names because you really were with some of the best in the business. Yeah, yeah. Well, I started in, um, um, in the local area with a standard bread trainer by the name of Paul Kelly, a successful trainer, doesn't have a huge stable and was really hands-on. And the first person I met in, in, um, in any sort of horse training, racing, and I started with standard breads <clears throat> as a teenager, he really took the time to teach me the right way of doing things. And then I, um, I switched over to Thoroughbreds. Chick McGahey was, was um, nice enough to give me a job, and I, I learned quite a bit from him. And then, um, then down the road, um, you know, through college and stuff at Cornell, 
I, I was thinking about the vet path at, at some point in time, but decided that when I got out of school, I, I wanted to go back to the racetrack, and I um, was fortunate enough to meet Bobby Frankel and move out west uh, to California to learn from him and his great team, and he really took, took everything to the next level for me. And you mentioned it earlier, uh, a small business. I think a lot of people don't realize that. Talk uh, about that in some aspect, that folks look at it as a sport and a trainer and the horses, but there's the whole back end where, particularly an operation the size of yours, you have a lot of employees, and so there's a whole business aspect to it that people may not realize. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge business aspect to it. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I... You know, I, um, I'm a horse trainer and I own my own company um, and, and like a lot of head trainers do and, um, and with that there's a lot of responsibilities and you have to balance things and uh, you know my primary job is to, to condition the horses and make a lot of good decisions based on their well-being, their development, evaluating horses uh, at all ages and classes and, uh, and that really needs to be where your talent lies. But in addition to that, there's a lot of other issues with running the company um, um, from a business side that can make you or break you. And, um, and I'm lucky to have been very well trained. But in addition to that, I, you have to learn on your own too. So we've, we've learned by trial and error as the company's grown over 10 years. And fortunately, I have a, an outstanding team under me that um, – that we don't have a lot of turnover with. I mean, these are people who've been with us a long time, with me, and um, and very talented at each of their specific duties every day. Yeah, again, I think a lot of people don't really put that all together, but as you say, it's a small business that you own, essentially. And I kind of laughed, again, before we get to the horses, I just want to touch on one more thing. I pulled up, there's actually a Chad Brown Wikipedia page, and I was looking at it last night, and I kind of laughed. I never know what exactly to believe off Wikipedia, but it said... <laughs> When you first approached the Saratoga uh, on your own as a trainer, you were turned down for stalls? Yeah, I, I <laughs> was denied my first application, and I was on a waiting list. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get stalled until just a few days before the meet. And, um, and luckily that first meet went on, too. We did, we did well right off the bat, and that's what you really need to do as a young trainer and, and start winning right away and get, and get those opportunities. It's, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because sometimes – in, in this business, I guess like a lot of business where it's a sport and there's a lot of, you know, competition um, to succeed, competition for clients, competition for opportunities, that um, it, it might look one way where, well, well, I worked for two Hall of Fame trainers and, you know, I had a great start. Well, on the other hand, you know, I didn't really grow up with any any family that, you know, gave me any shortcuts in the game. And, um, and even leaving Bobby, I didn't – have a whole lot of breaks. I had a great resume, but I wasn't given stalls. I was turned down um, stalls at the fairgrounds my first year, the Otoga. I mean, I was turned down at a handful of places, and I only had 10 horses. So you, you just have to go out there and surround yourself with the right people, and um, you have to kind of make your own opportunities. And uh, unfortunately, our team, me and my team, we've done that. Yeah, and done a great job with it, too. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, Wikipedia said uh, you had 10 horses, one with your first one, but it was immediately claimed? Um, yeah, <laughs> the very <laughs> first one at Churchill um, was a horse owned by uh, Ken and Sarah Ramsey, and, uh, and it was claimed, and then we're down to nine horses right away. <laughs> so they had to rebel, and it was a long time to wait for that next win. It took a while, and uh, but those are the, you know, the... the trials and tribulations you go through uh, starting your own business, and it's not going to be easy. Um, we know that, and uh, like I said, I've had, a, have a, I've had a lot of luck along the way, too. Just being in the right place at the right time, and when you have an opportunity, you got to seize it. Yeah, well, as they say, you got to make some of your own luck, and you've done a great job, and let's talk about some of the horses, because my, how things have changed. But let's go uh, right to Saturday afternoon at Gulfstream, the Mucho Macho Man. We're kind of taking the baby steps along what is potentially – you know, the Triple Crown Trail, as the uh, calendar turned, so did the age of the horses. So we're now talking three-year-olds. And in the uh, Mucho Macho Man at Gulfstream on Saturday afternoon, you have Mask, who really looked good in that career debut on October 20th at Belmont. 
uh, wins over Navistar. Navistar was a $900,000 two-year-old OBS purchase who won next time out. So that was a nice impressive win, nice 88 buyer figure. Talk a little bit about how Mask is coming into the race uh, and what you expect Saturday afternoon in Lucha Macho Man. Hey, Mask is doing very well. Uh, this horse has always been very highly guarded in our arms. Uh, he's always, and, uh, and he's, always, he's always showed a ton of ability. Um, he took a little while to get to the races. He had some baby things he was dealing with in Saratoga, primarily some sore shins and stuff. And then we waited to the fall uh, to debut him, gave him his time, and he didn't disappoint us. He ran terrific. And the next thing that raised, a few more little baby issues, we'll call them, just uh, minor things maybe just to give him some time, be patient. We kept him with us. He was always in some sort of training. We just backed off the gas pedal a little bit with him and let him come into himself and grow a little bit. And, and he has done that. We've shifted him to Florida, and he just he filled out. He looks terrific, and he's sound, and he seems to be over all of his uh, immaturity issues physically and really training well. So I'm really excited to see him run tomorrow. You like the one-turn mile? I do. That's why I'm running him in a stake. It's, it really wouldn't be my move off a little mini layoff and only a second star, first time stretching out a bit. I'd rather run an allowance race and only run against horses that have only uh, won one race like him. But I just don't have that distance to race yeah. right in front of me now, and he's ready to run. And uh, I think he's talented enough to make the jump. So uh, not a perfect setup for me, condition-wise, but I like the distance and the timing. All right, let's catch up a little bit. Good Magic, uh, finalist for the two-year-old of the year, the winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, went into that as a maiden. Let's talk a little bit about the early part of the career, though, because this was a buzz horse up at Saratoga. Winds up second in the career debut. Then you move right into the Champagne, a good second there. Were the, were the second place finishes a little bit disappointing, given the, the expectations for the horse? Yeah, the first one was. <clears throat> I, I, I thought he was well... Uh, lined up to, to break his debut in good fashion up at Saratoga and then stretch him out from there. And I was surprised he just couldn't get by uh, his rival there. Um, and I was quite disappointed after the race. And it took me a few days to, to really bounce out of it mentally to, to figure this out. But I thought he had a really good line on this horse, and I just couldn't believe that we could be wrong. But he did run well. He didn't win. And uh, it was a, it was apparent that in the days after that the track was really biased those few days. And, I hate to use that excuse, but the, the rail was so, so good. And if you were just off the rail, you were at a disadvantage. And so we went with that. We trained on, and, and he trained great uh, when I got him to Belmont. And I said, you know, I'm just going to draw a line through that and, and go right into a stake because he's, I'm going to treat him like he won. And uh, he nearly pulled it off. I thought he ran terrific. It's unfortunate he got run down late. But he did most of the work up near the front, and that horse came and got him. And uh, it was enough for me to go on to the Breeders' Cup if he – showed us continued improvement in the morning, which he did. And what's the game plan now? I understand he's back with you training. Yeah, he just got back to me. We gave him a little bit of time over at Stone Street, Ocala Division, where he was broke. And uh, he just was sent back into me um, well, over a week ago. He's training really well. And uh, we're just going to take it from there. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks I can start breathing him. All right. got to ask about another horse because uh, there was some – uh, news in maybe the middle of December, Lady Eli comes out of the disappointment in the Breeders' Cup, but obviously there was the excuse there with the cut, and that uh, made her avoid the sales she was scheduled for. And then about the middle of December, there was some talk that maybe she would come back to the races. Has any decision been made about at Lady Eli? No, uh, I think that decision's coming soon. Um, <clears throat> I, I haven't been given any... Um, the final decision by anyone uh, relate to me. She's still at the farm in Kentucky. I do know that. And uh, and I'm in fully healed, uh, thank God. And uh, So she's doing well, but I think they're going to decide this week, hopefully. Yeah, the pictures were really brutal. Was the cut as bad as the pictures looked? Yeah, she was cut up pretty bad, and actually she lost a shoe um, very early in the race. She sent me a picture of a shoe flying over the head of a jockey right behind her an eighth of a mile into the race, so um, <clears throat> so that was unfortunate as well. Uh, she lost one of her shoes that early, so just, again, not a big excuse maker, but um, uncharacteristic of her finish, and um, she definitely had an excuse. Yeah, there, that, so. that, 
That's one where you, you can buy into the excuse, particularly if you saw the pictures. But she was, has been one of the great stories over the, the past couple of seasons, so it's going to be fun yeah. to see what they decide to do. Another horse from last year, uh, get a little update on cloud computing. And as we talk about cloud computing again in the Q&A Tim Wilkin did with you, uh, he asked if he had one horse, a wow horse from the season, and it was cloud computing. And I assume because he put the first classic, the first triple crown race on your resume. Talk a little bit about your win in the uh, Preakness with cloud computing. Yeah, what a feeling that was, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you know, we've, we've been lucky to participate in a lot of big races and Breeders' Cup success and, and such. And, um, but nothing like, uh, had, you know, being in there in a triple crown race and getting it done and that horse to finish there was close. And it was quite a thrill. It was our, our, our highlight of the year last year. And he's back with me at Palmetto's in some light training. He really looks good. Um, after two races at Saratoga, he didn't fire, and we found a chip in his front ankle. So hopefully that was the reason for that. And it seems to have gone really smooth. The surgery is his ankles look fine. He's nice and sound. So we're optimistic he's going to have a big year this year. You have any uh, timetable? No, uh, not yet. Um, all I can say is I, I, it's doubtful he'll, he'll see any action in South Florida down here. He won't be ready. But by the time we head up to New York, I'm hoping about that time uh, he'll be ready to do something. Sounds good. All right, I also want to touch on Rushing Fall. Really nice two-year-old filly. And again, uh, you had six horses in among the finalists for Eclipse Awards. Rushing Fall was in. As a two-year-old filly, interesting because her three races, three wins, were all on the turf. Talk a little bit about her two-year-old season, your expectations for her as a three-year-old now. Um, what can I say? Just flawless. This filly went out there and ran three huge races for us in seven weeks' time is hard to do, uh, particularly on the turf. And I, I like to give my horse a little bit more time in between starts. I'm so proud of her that she's able to get it done. Quite a talent. Since the first time we saw her breeze on the turf, we knew she was something special. Um, you know, I'm crossing my fingers that, um, that the voters uh, really consider her. I know that she's a turf horse, but she's undefeated. And, uh, and just ran outstanding all three starts. Uh, in a short frame, frame of time, like I said, um, time frame, excuse me, um, so we'll just see how it pans out. But um, she's at the farm right now in Stone Street as well and um, scheduled to come into us in about two weeks. Her first start of the year is going to be at Keeneland. Uh, and I want to touch on th this, to me, a very, very interesting story. Stellar Wynn goes to the sales. They pay a lot of money. And they come out of the sale and say, you know what, maybe we'll try the Pegasus. And Stellar Wind goes into your barn. Fill us in on how she's doing and what you're expecting in a few weeks down the road in the Pegasus. Yeah, I, I, I got the call and that they were going to send her in. And, um, you know, I, we appreciate the opportunity to work with her. Is, and, the, uh, is the pressure on in that kind of situation? <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, it's a, it's a big price tag for her, but we're not, it, 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 you know, we've, We've had this kind of pressure with expensive horses before. Yeah. And we, we, you know, our team, we want the ball if we're given the opportunity. That's just how we are. And, um, um, but, you know, it's a big horse race. And um, it's not like she's one of the favorites, but she's, a, you know, a champion horse. And she came into me in very good condition. Uh, the plan was really just to train her along and see how she does. And if she's doing outstanding, we'll run her in the race. And as I'm told, it'll be her last start, and then she'll be bred. Um, and if she's not up to it, there's no pressure to run her. And she came in. I wasn't really knowing what to expect. She didn't really run around the Breeders' Cup. Maybe she's had enough and she's turning sick. But I'll tell you, she is training really well. So um, right now we're on target for the race. And uh, I'm curious to see what she'll do in there. Yeah, she'll be a fun story, certainly, going into that event. All right, Chad, before we let you go, I uh, always like to give our listeners, our viewers here, some ideas. And you've got some maidens on Sunday's card at Gulfstream, and I just wanted to touch on them because a couple of first-time starters and a European import and get some thoughts. The sixth race at Gulfstream on Sunday, it's a maiden special. First, I want to talk about the Clarevich first-time starter. This horse is kind of interesting, competitive balance. I love Into Mischief as producing precocious runners. He's the sire of this four-year-old filly, and that's what's interesting. Competitive Balance bought at a two-year-old sale in March of 2016, a couple hundred thousand dollars, into mischief on top, but clearly a little bit of a delayed debut. What are you looking for for uh, Competitive Balance on Sunday? Um, finally got her there. Uh, obviously had some physical issues. Lately, she's been training good. When we bought her, we weren't originally thinking turf with that pedigree, but... Um, 
finally got her onto the grass in the, the morning drills, and she moved up on it. So I'm going to get her to where I think she belongs, and uh, we'll see see what happens. I mean, she's um, she's finally making her debut, you know, this late in her life. So I'm not real bullish on on saying that she's ready to win first time out, but she does train like she has some ability. Battle flag is in the same race. This horse has had three starts, but they were all in Europe. Hasn't been seen since March of last year by Warfront. Um, why the move over? Adds Lasix. Is that the is that the reason why the move over from Europe? But these European horses. What's your game plan when you get them over, and what what is the kind of the training regimen to to move them into American racing? Well, I'm not sure exactly the circumstances to move over here, but. Uh... Joe Wynn races as they get older over in America. As I understand, he sent me a, a handful, including her. So okay. um, she came into me in really good shape. Uh, she's training in particularly well. And, uh, you know, we get these European horses, and we have a basic program that we, we put them in that, that Bobby taught me. But then once they're in the program, we start to evaluate them, and they, they sort of get separated, and, and we form their individual program for them. But um, so we put this filly into our program, what we normally do, and she's responded really well. I expect her to give a real good account of herself. Johnny Velasquez on board on Sunday. And uh, the eighth race on Sunday, uh, one more horse to talk about. Another maiden special event on the grass at a mile. Reverse the decision. It's another Klarovich horse. This one a little more like a Klarovich horse. This is only a three-year-old, but don't forget, last week was still a two-year-old. So this is getting a more timely uh, debut. Talk a little bit about reverse the decision in the career debut coming up on Sunday. Um, she's training really well. This is a filly that we've always thought a lot of. She just took a little bit of time to get there. I had a couple little minor issues in the fall. I had her about ready to run in New York, and, and I had to back off a touch. Uh, got her down to Florida. She resumed training and been doing fabulous. She's a horse I have high hopes for. All right, Chad. Uh... I, we appreciate uh, your time. Again, we kick off our uh, programming, our Saturday morning programming, and you'll be one of our first guests. So we appreciate your taking the time. We know it's precious, and uh, we not only appreciate your time, but we wish you good luck, not only uh, with mask on uh, Saturday, but with the whole 2018 season. So a happy new year, and, and good luck to you and the whole team. Thank you, Appreciate that, Chad. Appreciate the, uh,